Good morning. Welcome again to Morning Devotions. I'm Pastor Summer, the pastor of the Cathedral of Pray. So what a privilege it is to be with you every morning. I know I say that every morning, but you know what? You could be doing a lot of things. You could be involved in a lot of things, but you chose to allow me as your pastor to be a part of your life and to walk through this difficult journey of COVID-19 with you. You see, part of the role of a shepherd is to be in the fields with the sheep. You know, shepherds are not professionals. We're, we're, we're laborers, all right? We're, we're laborers in a harvest field. We're, we're shepherds with the sheep. And maybe the most difficult thing for all of us on pastoral staff at COP, at least, is we haven't been in a single hospital to visit you in, what, 15 months now? We haven't been in a single home to visit you, but we can come to you with all of the video things that we're doing because we walk this journey together and we started this journey together and we'll finish this journey together. Every day, we just want to bring you some encouragement. Though I have to admit, the Psalms today, hi, <laughs> okay, we're mercy people. But li listen to this song that David sang. Psalms chapter 58, beginning with verse six. Now remember, he's talking about his enemies that are always attacking him. Oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions. Tear out the fangs. The, the, these, th this is the part used to hurt and kill. The, the teeth, the fangs. He said, God, you know these people that are always attacking me? They're, they're like lions, and, and their danger is in their fangs. Just tear out the fangs of these young lions. And, <laughs> and notice, young. Have you ever noticed there comes a point when there are rebellious young people who just want to destroy everything around them? They're like young lions. They, they got lots of hormones going in their body. They got lots of testosterone going, and they really think they're somebody <laughs> when they're really nobody. Tear out the fangs. Destroy the thing that they use to hurt with. Let them vanish like water that runs away. When he aims his arrows, let them be blunted. You know, God, all those arrows that these people are shooting at me, let them be blunted. You know, they, 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 they won't pierce. They won't cause damage. Now notice, he, he's saying, no more damage. He said, God, let there be no more damage against my life from these people. Let them be like a snail that dissolves into slime, like a stillborn child who never sees the sun. In other words, let these people just go away. Nothing that they dream of, let it, let it flourish. Let, let everything be like a stillborn child. They had lots of hopes. They talked a big game, but there was no future. In other words, there's, God, this is no future. Take away the future of these people. This is his song. Take away their future. Sooner than your pots can feel the heat of thorns, whether green or ablaze, may he sweep them away. God, just, just sweep it away. Just, just remove it from, from consciousness of society. The righteous, now here, here's, a, here's an amazing truth. The righteous will rejoice when he sees vengeance. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. Mankind will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on the earth. Now, you know, brothers and sisters, we are mercy people. <laughs> and there's a reason we're mercy people. But there are people that just set themselves as enemies. And they're not nice people and they're not, they're not right. All right, that they're not right. God's vengeance will come on them. And when the vengeance comes, others will look and they will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. There is a God who judges on the earth. So when you, you, you see people just, when you see people rising up in rebellion and then they, you just see them like they're stillborn, you need to understand the hand of God is at work. When you see all their hopes just destroyed, they just they just go away. The hand of God is at work. When you see them just swept away, the hand of God is at work. And you need to look, listen, 
and learn and rejoice that there is a reward for the righteous. There is a God who judges on the earth. Father, sometimes when we think of your judgment, it's hard for us to understand because all we've ever seen in our lives from you is your mercy and your grace. You've never appointed us under wrath. But Father, I ask in this world, let there be a distinction between the just and the unjust. And Lord, we ask for your judgment on the wicked. We ask for your judgment on the wicked, Lord. Let the world stand up and see and learn that there is a God in heaven and that there is a God who judges and that there is a reward for the righteous. Father, I lift to you all of your sons and daughters today. Father, many people are just really tired these days. But Lord, I thank you that you strengthen them in their inner being by the power of your Holy Spirit. And that, Lord, they can stand because you make them stand. You give them the spiritual and you give them the physical strength to stand in the middle of all of this. I pray for every father. I pray for every mother. I pray for every single mom, Lord. Lord, in the name of Jesus, let them be strong on the inside. Not harsh, not mean, but strong. Father, like a rock in the lives of their families, that their children will look at them and just see stability and strength because you've placed it in those moms and dads. You've placed it in those single moms. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name for healing to flow. Father, we ask you, let healing flow. We hear all of the things going on out there, Lord. Let healing flow. In the lung center right now, Father, for our people there, let healing flow into the bodies of your sons and daughters. Lord, let this COVID thing just be stopped in its tracks in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters with cancer in their bodies right now. Lord, let all the fear leave their body in Jesus' name. Let there be no fear, Lord. Let there be just a simple rest of faith. Lord, you know how to make yourself real to them. In your mercy, Father, we don't ask for signs before we believe. but We ask for mercy. Just like that leper came and said to you, Lord, that if you really care because you feel something when you look at me, you can make me whole. Lord, I ask, just like Jesus reached out and touched him and showed that he cared, Lord, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Reach out and in your mercy, touch them. Reach out and in your mercy, show them that you care, show them that you love. Father, I thank you for it. I worship you for it, Father. I worship you for it, Father. Lord, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Father, in the name of Jesus, for financial provision, Lord, daily bread, not just what we need right now, Lord, but the daily bread, the food given in advance. Take your people out of need and move them into bodega living. The Father, the food will always be there in advance. The moms and dads are never worried about the next day's food. Move them into bodega living, Father. Living out of their bodega, always having more than enough. I thank you, Father, for the bills, Lord. Most of our people, Lord, are really prospering at this time. But there's that one group of our members, Lord, that are still struggling. Lord, I ask that you turn things around for them. Lord, just turn it around. Lord, turn it around. All the debts paid, all the bills paid. Father, you know how you can do it. We, we don't want to bring to you our solutions, Lord, because you have a better solution. For every family, Father, for every family, let there be a miracle of provision that the tuitions are paid, the Morelco is paid, all of the back rentals are paid, all of the back everything is paid. Father, bring your provision into every family. I thank you for it, Father, and I worship you for it. And Father, we ask you for a great harvest of souls. And Father, we recognize it's out there. We ask you for new laborers, Father. 
Father, I ask you for a new generation of young men and young women who aren't selfish, who aren't self-centered, who aren't in this for themselves. Father, willing to lay down their lives. Raise up a whole new generation, Father, and build churches all across this nation. We thank you for that harvest coming in. And Lord, we ask you for the laborers to bring in that harvest. But Father, we ask you for laborers. No more hirelings, Father. Lord, supernaturally remove the hirelings, those that are just in it to make a money, those that are just in it for a job. Lord, supernaturally just remove those people from among us and re remove them from among the, the futures. Father, let us have a generation. Lord, we believe you're coming soon. We need a generation without hirelings. We need a generation of laborers. We need a generation like the apostles who will lay down everything. Lord, we know that you'll prosper us. But Lord, lay a generation of those that are willing to walk in sacrifice. I thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's open up our hearts now and spend some time in worship.
Our Old Testament passage today picks up in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1. And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people. He said, all right, that, there, was, there was a purpose. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came out of Egypt. Opposing them. God said, I have noted. God keeps records. Now, this is a long time later, okay? This is, this is well over 100 years later. God has never forgotten what Amalek did as he opposed Israel coming out of the slavery. God never forgets. Folks, God keeps records. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them at Tilaim, 200,000 men on foot, 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed. Now, never forget people who helped you. Even, even when close to your enemies. Now, there's a principle you got to get a hold of. See, there are people that in life becomes friends with people who have tried to destroy you. But they're not trying to destroy you, but they're friends with people who have tried to destroy you. And God says, you know, never forget these people. They showed kindness to you at one time in your past. Now, that you have the upper hand and you're stronger, don't forget the kindness. Okay, don't... Don't forget the, well, you know, they're different now. They're, they're with my enemies. No, they were still kind to you at one point in the past. Don't forget to show kindness to them. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agog, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people at the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, the best of the sheep and the oxen, the fatted calves and lambs, and all that was good all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. All right, so they judged what they judged how to obey. Now that's a dangerous situation to get into. All right, God said you are to devote to destruction all they have. All right, now notice this: all they have. And now they made a judgment, worthless, despised, destroy. All that was good, do not destroy. Now, now brothers and sisters, here, here's a, a, a great truth you need to get a hold of. Just obey. Don't make decisions. No decisions. How to obey. When God said, this is what you're going to do, don't think that you're smarter than God. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I made Saul king. God has regrets. People asked me one time, do you have any regrets? Yeah. But I don't consider that a sin. God had regrets. I regret that I made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried out to the Lord all night. Have you ever regretted? Now, now please, businessmen, hold steady with me. Have you ever chose somebody for a position, that, and you hired somebody, and you thought they were going to be really good, and you promoted them, and you held them up in front of everybody, just like God did King Saul? Yeah. And then later you find out, you know what? The outside and the inside are two different things. This is exactly what God is saying. 
I have made Saul king. I gave him this position. I recruited him and placed him and anointed him, gave him authority and ability for this position. But I regret that I did it. I've regretted people that I've hired at the church. <laughs> this, is, this is the real, everybody say, real life. This is real life now. Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel and behold, he has set up a monument. Wow. For himself. And turned and passed on down to Gilgal. Wow. So here's this guy. And God already knew this. Okay. God knew. Samuel didn't know it yet, but God knew. Samuel might have been a little puzzled. Okay, God, God regrets it. Okay. Now he finds out why God regrets it. Usually the people that you regret putting into position are people that start wanting all the attention focused on them. And that's exactly what happened here. And Samuel said to Saul, if Saul said to him, blessed are you, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Really? You did? Really? See, he thinks that by obeying what he thinks is right, and dis discarding the rest of it was obedience. It's not. And Samuel said, what then is this bleating of sheep in my ears and lowing of oxen that I hear? He said, oh, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep to sacrifice to the Lord, and the rest will be, we have devoted to destruction. Really? Really? The, the, this is what you call excuses and spin. They didn't spare all that for, for the, no, they spared the best for themselves. But now he's caught, so Saul tries to put a spin on it. Then Saul said, Samuel said to Saul, stop. Just, 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 just stop. Okay, stop the spin. Stop, stop the, the, the excuses. All right, just, just, just stop it. Samuel said, now here's one of the greatest passages for leadership in the Bible. Then Samuel said, though you were little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. Wow. When you were little in your own eyes. One of the great passages of leadership. When you're little in your own eyes, God can use you. But when you start setting up monuments for yourself, when you start wanting everything with your name on it, when you start thinking that you're smarter than God, you got a problem. The Lord sent you on a mission and said, go devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce upon the spoil? This was all about what you wanted to keep for yourself. And do what is evil on the side of the Lord. And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission that the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalekite. And I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. Here comes the spin. But the people took the spoil. All right, here we do. Here is another principle of leadership. Never hide behind people you serve. People are not a shield. It's all their fault. The people, the people. He said, oh, but the people, the, the people had a good motive. Good motives do not equal obedience. Sorry, good motives do not equal obedience. Never use the people. And some of you leaders, forgive me. You know, God calls you to account for something that's gone on. And immediately you, you want to hide behind the people. Now, some of you employers, you, you call in a department head and you hold them accountable for something in, in your company. 
And they just turn and blame it all on the people that they were supposed to be leading. At some point, you don't hide behind the people and you don't just say, well, they had good motives. No. Good motives do not equal obedience. And Samuel said, has the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Okay, I, you know, you, you say that you kept this for worship, but that's not what God asked you to do. Obedience, better to obey than to sacrifice, better to listen than offering the fat of rams. Okay, obedience Obedience and listening is greater than offerings. I looked at a businessman one time and he said, Pastor Summerall, I did this business deal and I know that you won't approve of it. But he said, I've got a big offering for the Lord. I said, well, what was the business deal? And he told me what it was. I said, you know, that's not right. He said, but I got a big offering for the Lord. I said, you don't buy peace with God. God doesn't care about your money. I said, don't, don't, don't give that in the offering. Don't, don't, don't even begin. Well, I've got this big tithe, Pastor. Don't, don't even put that in the offering. Because you think that your offering is greater than obedience, and you think your offering is greater than listening to what God says. I said, it's not. God doesn't care about your money. If God wants money, he can just think it, and there'll be a pile of gold six feet tall standing in front of you. you. You've got to get a hold of this truth. Obedience and listening is greater than offering. And then he says, for rebellion, and here's a big one, for rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. Now, he has also rejected you as king. Now, get a hold of this. Rebellion equals witchcraft. Presumption, thinking that you, you know more than God, is sin and idolatry. Now, anytime you see people in, in rebellion, have you ever noticed how quickly they go from bad to worse, to worse, to worse, to worse, to worse, how quickly they spiral down? Yeah, because they're tied into demons. Satan rebelled against God. Rebellion flows right to the heart of Satan. You, you've got to make sure that you never do anything in rebellion. <laughs> and presumption, thinking that you know more than God, thinking that, that you know best, that's sin and idolatry. Wow. And then God said, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, I have rejected you from being king. Now notice, rejected the word of the Lord. There are many preachers in this world that are rejected by God because they rejected his word. There are many great businessmen that started out as Christians that have lost their businesses because they rejected God's word. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words. Notice, your words. <laughs> Again, he, he discounts the importance of the word, okay? The commandment of the Lord, okay. But he said, you know, and your words. He, he, he discounts. He discounts the words. Now, as a pastor, I've seen people do this many times. I said, this is what the Bible says. Well, you know, pastor, I can't do what you, you, you say. Those aren't my words. Those are God's words. See, when you start discounting biblical teaching because you think you know better or you think you have an excuse, and he said, the excuse is because I feared the people and obeyed their voice, okay? That this is hiding behind the people again. Here's hiding behind the people again. He said, I, I, I've got an excuse for, for, for not listening. No, you don't. There's no excuses. No excuses. For diso There's no excuses for disobedience. 
Obedience is a decision. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. Karabi Talaga, you, you do what you want to do, and then you just say, okay, let's let's get forgiven and just act like nothing ever happened. And that's what people want to do today. They think there are they think no consequences, okay? So he thinks no consequences. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord. Now he said, notice, these are not my words. These are the words of the Lord. And the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. There are consequences. And Samuel turned to go away. Saul seized the skirt of his robe and tore it. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. This day and given it who is better than you. All right. God's choice. is better. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Then he said, I have sinned. He said, I have sinned. Yet honor me now before the elders of the people and before Israel and return with me that I may bow before the Lord your God. All he thinks about is, he's thinking about face. This is the guy who built the monument, remember? He's thinking about his face. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul bowed before the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord as at Gilgal. Wow. A prophet Oh, I need a pen that works. Well, I need a screen that works is what's true. A prophet obeyed. The king would not obey. But the prophet obeyed. It wasn't the role of the prophet to kill this king. That was the role of the king to kill the king. But since the king didn't do it, the prophet did. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And Saul and Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. So God's regrets. But I want you to notice two things here. As a leader, Samuel grieved over Saul, never stopped loving, never stopped caring, but he never laid eyes on him again. You know, there are some people that when they have so disobeyed God, I'm just done forever. I don't ever want to see their face again. Does it mean that you stop loving? No, Saul. Samuel obviously loved Saul. He grieved over him until the day of his death. But he never laid eyes on him again because of what he had done to the people of Israel, because of how he had dishonored God before the people of Israel. Chapter 16, verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? Hey, Samuel, come on. Get it together, dude. Since I have rejected him from being king over Israel, fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king from among his sons. I have provided for myself. <laughs> I, I, I just love that truth. God, whoops. God provides for himself. God provides his leadership. And Samuel said, how can I go if Saul hears that he will kill me? 
And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to sacrifice. I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. So Saul did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and saying, do, do you come peaceably? <laughs> and he said, peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked at Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or his height of stature because I have rejected him. God said, no, I've rejected him. There are people that God rejects for leadership. Okay. There are people God rejects for leadership. Not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. You say, well, pastor, how do we recognize who God has rejected? What comes out of their hearts? I mean, we're not like God. We can't look into their hearts, but we can see their hearts, at least in part. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What are his actions like? A good man brings good out of the good that is stored up in his heart. A bad person brings up bad out of the bad stored up in his heart. So listen to the abundance of the mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. See the fruit that comes out. Is it a fruit of destruction or is it a fruit of blessing in life? Look and see their actions, you know. Are, are, they, are they serving the kingdom or are they playing video games all day long? Okay, then you begin to look at, at seeing the hearts. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel and said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Now, now notice, Abinadab is not chosen. Now notice the difference here. This person is rejected. This person is not chosen. Now, there's a difference here. There is a difference here. There are people that God said, no, this is just not their place. But there are people that it could have been their place, but they were rejected. Ah, so notice, rejected, chosen. These, these, are, these are big words. And Jesse made Shammah pass by. Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Now again, notice, we have a difference between rejected and chosen. Please keep this in mind. There are people that are wonderful people and they haven't been rejected but that's simply just not their place. There are other people, it could have been their place, but God saw something in their heart that made him reject them. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all these your, are all your sons here? And he said, yet there remains the youngest, but behold, he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent him and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, Grabe. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Samuel rose up and went to Samuel. Now, went, went to Ramah. Now, now, brothers and sisters, just get a hold of this. The brothers saw the destiny of of the Bunso, okay? The brother saw baby brother's destiny. And do you remember how they tormented him before Goliath? And how they made fun of him and mocked him and bullied him? You see, folks, sometimes when people recognize the anointing on your life and they, they recognize the destiny that God has for you, you're going to find that they, they're not nice to you. So, I want you to notice the brothers the brothers like Joseph's did not respect 
the destiny. There will be many people, when they see the anointing on your life for destiny, they won't respect it either. Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. Now that, that's one of those question marks in my Bible. A harmful spirit from the Lord. Now yeah, I can give you lots of theological explanations for it, but suffice it for right now, that's one of those things you put in your Bible a question mark next to because that's something that needs a lot of study. The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So I want you to notice he had the office, but no anointing. He had the office, but no anointing. The anointing leaves before the office is vacated. Now you, you, you need to get a hold of that. Anointing and office are not the same. The anointing and office are just not the same. I've, I've watched businessmen lose the anointing for business, but they still have the office. I've watched preachers lose the anointing, but they still have the office. And people still walk around and call them pastor, and they walk around and call them bishop, but the anointing's gone. There's no more miracles. There's no more souls. There's no more... There's no more flow of life. And, and that, that's what I look for. When, when, when the Spirit of God is someplace, there is a flow of life. Okay, there's a flow of life. When there's no Holy Ghost, there's no flow of life. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold, now a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Now again, that's that question mark. Let now our Lord command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and he will be well. And Saul said to his servants, provide me a man who can play well and bring him here to me. One of the young men answered, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing. He's a man of valor. He's a man of war. He's prudent in speech. He's a good speaker. He's a man of good presence. In other words, he dresses well and looks good. And the Lord is with him. Six characteristics of the anointing. Six characteristics of a man of a man rising. A man rising. God's hand is upon him. How, how do you see these things? Well, he's skillful. He's taken, a, he's taken an ability and developed it to a skill. He's brave. He knows how to fight. He's a good speaker. He has good presence. He looks good. And the Lord, and that's the biggest one, the Lord is with him. Therefore, Jesse sent messenger, or Saul sent messengers to Jesse, saying, Send me your son who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David to his, to his son Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his servant. And Saul loved him greatly and became his armor bearer. And Jesse said, And Saul said to Jesse, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my eyes. But whenever the harmful spirit from God was on Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. Now, I want you to see some. There's a lot of things in here that if we had time to teach. Music. Worship. David was a great worshiper. Worship drives off demon spirits. But I also want you to notice the love. Saul loved him. But I also want you to notice the one with the anointing brings comfort to the one who has lost the anointing. <laughs> the one with the anointing comforts. The one who has lost the anointing. Great truth.
All right, let's open up our hearts and spend some time in worship. I was a loser most of my life. I knew no other way. I tried and tried, always failed because of what I've said. Then one day I met the man yeah. who took away all of my sin. He took me away from my losing ways, taught me how to win. I cannot be defeated, no, then I will not quit. Redeemed by the blood of Jesus, I will lose from Satan's pit. Jesus fought comes up now and then he tries to make it look so bad it's when i say god's at work in my life i know i can't be had i just lift up the word of god and give all satan a fit i cannot be New Testament passage today picks up in John chapter 10 and that Old Testament passage was big so we're going to have to try to move a little quickly through this. John 10 beginning with verse 1. Truly truly I say to you he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way is a thief and a robber. All right so now back down just come down here to this other verse here verse 7. Jesus is the door of the sheep. So anybody who comes into the local church that doesn't come in by Jesus, but they climb in some other way. See, Jesus is the one who brought us into your life as pastors, all right? Anybody who climbs in another way is a thief and a robber. Putting it simply, we entered into your life through Jesus. Anybody who comes into your life other than through Jesus is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the, by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Okay? 
he who enters by the door is the shepherd. You want to tell, you want to see a real shepherd. A shepherd is someone who Jesus has brought in. Jesus is the door of the sheep pen. Jesus is the door of the local church. Okay. You enter through Jesus into a local church. Okay. If the local, if this, if this is, if this is a local church, this is the door. This is Jesus. These are all the members. Who enters? Only the shepherd. The shepherd enters through the door. People who start coming in other ways, they're thieves and robbers. Remember that as a church member. Jesus is the door of the local church. To the gate, to him the gatekeeper opens. To who? To the shepherd. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And he, when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. You often hear me talk about the voice of a shepherd. The sheep know the shepherd's voice. A stranger they will not follow. But they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying. Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Jesus said, I'm the door. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, go in and out and find pasture. In other words, Jesus said, I'm also the only way to be saved. I'm the only way into the local church. Jesus is the entrance to a local church. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Now, does that sound like poverty? You know, it, it, it's become woke. And I don't even like that word. It's like wake up. Yeah, but woke is this new word of, of what's culturally popular today. The new woke culture. It's become woke in Christian culture to be anti-prosperity. And it's the new popular thing. But you know what? I don't teach avarice and greed. But Jesus said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. My job as a pastor is to help you walk into that abundant life. He said, I'm also the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He is our example. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. Now, again, tremendous teaching here. There are shepherds. And then there are hirelings or hired hands. Both are called pastor today. But some are not pastors. They're just hired hands. How can you tell a hired hand? Because when they see danger, they run. They abandon the sheep in times of COVID-19. They abandon the sheep in times of, of political danger. They abandon the sheep in times of calamity. They, they run. They, they take care of themselves. Now, this is one of the reasons why we're helping these pastors. We've got 100 pastors in the province that we're helping. You know, as a congregation, we give these pastors 5,000 pesos a month so that they can focus on reopening their churches. Because these men and these women did not run. They went hungry, they went without, but they did not run. Now, another thing I want you to notice, how do you recognize the difference between a wolf and a shepherd? A wolf scatters, a shepherd gathers. <laughs> Anytime you see somebody scattering the flock, that's a wolf. Now, it might be a wolf in sheep's clothing, but that's a wolf. 
He flees because he's a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. Pastors that run away, I don't care how profusely they say they love you, they don't care. I am a good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. He is our example as a pastor. Our example. The pastor's example. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Pastor, what does that mean? I have no idea. Probably the Gentiles. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. For there will be one flock and one shepherd. Okay, one flock, one shepherd. This is the universal church. Jesus is the great shepherd. Have you ever noticed I always call myself the under-shepherd of COP? When you see me sign something, I'm the under-shepherd? Because Jesus is the pastor. There's one flock, and that's Jesus' flock. And there's one shepherd, and that's Jesus. But I, the, other, the other sheep, I, th this is more than likely the Gentiles, okay? For this reason, the Father loves me. Now, you got to get a hold of that verse. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again, all right? Several truths I want you to see here. There's a reason for love. And then there's Jesus is not a martyr. Jesus is not a martyr. No man killed him. Jesus laid his life down. Now, there's a reason for love. There's a reason for love. The father loved the son because the son laid down his life for the sheep. He sacrificed for the sheep. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up. This charge I received from my father. There was again a division among the Jews by his words. Many of them said, he has a demon. He's insane. Why listen to him? <laughs> because he has the words of life. Others said, these are not the words of a man who's oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? When Jesus starts teaching strong, it's amazing how people separate. But I want you to notice here, only wolves bring separation, bring scattering. Anytime you see scattering happen within a church, there's a wolf scattering people. And as a people, you need to draw really close to the shepherd. The shepherds will protect you from the scatterers. So when, when you see somebody scattering people, pull away and pull close to the shepherds. The shepherds will keep the wolves away. All right. Little bit of wisdom now from Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 1. <laughs> Do not be envious of evil men. Do not desire to be with them. You see these big, powerful people? Don't, don't be envious and don't desire their companionship. You know, we don't live by contacts. And by contacts, I'm talking about your ability to say, I'm close to this person or I'm close to that person. That's not how we live. And that's not how we succeed in life. I remember one of the big things I made people angry about back in the 80s. I said, listen... Your kids don't need to go to La Salle or Antoneo to have a good future. They need to know Jesus to have a good future. And I said, no, Pastor, they need to make the relationships in college that they will need for their business. I said, that is a world based on contacts. And I said, you have the greatest contact in the world. You, you know God. Okay, please. You don't, you don't need to be close to these people for contacts. And there's a reason. For their hearts devise violence, and their lips talk of trouble. He said, listen, if you hang out with these people, you're going to join them in trouble. By wisdom, a house is built. And by understanding, it is established. By knowledge... Its rooms are filled with precious and pleasant riches. All right, so by wisdom, 
Let's just highlight these words, by wisdom, by understanding, and by knowledge. So wisdom will build a house. Wisdom builds. Understanding makes permanent. Knowledge brings prosperity. Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Beautiful truths. All right, we went a little long today. Thank you for being with us today, and thank you for being patient. We'll see you tonight as we get back into the Book of Romans, 7 o'clock. See you then.